we enter into the into the um, community who have been involved in criminal justice or in the criminal system and to look at issues around programs that are effectively uh, helping folks around health disparities those were the three areas and this could be individuals or families and I said I want to understand not only do I want to know about these programs I want you to tell me how they are evaluated to determine if they're effective and what are the components of those that are culture specific in other words very deliberately mm -hmm. cultural not kind of as a, they happen to be black I want to know if the curricular materials that they utilize within these programs are, are culture specific matter of fact these are the these are the most important parts of your paper and what I received back from my students were quite a few first of all um, I told them they couldn't use any local program in Portland they had to look you know really nationally and they came back with some phenomenal information about programs at work and what the major element that I could say went through every single one of them was the culture specific component was the idea of increasing an understanding of one's cultural roots values beliefs those became central to the educational programs to the reentry programs and to those dealing with health disparities all of them looked at one part of it was looking at culture and looking at the importance of identity value and worth that intrinsic sense of self that was one of the most critical components to the effectiveness of the program as stated by them and as identified in the evaluation criteria so what we do know is that this is effective and important now why then given the fact this is empirical this is not you know my opinion this is the reason why I want them to research it and to show me the evaluate evaluations is if we know this is true why does it continue to be such a fight in fact in Arizona aside from the fact that people are trying to make people produce or have made it so folks can produce some evidence of being citizens uh, there's also a bill to eliminate all ethnic and cultural studies there's, there's a bill right now and the the reason for it is they say is uh, as it's stated by this particular political figure is that they they say that with the these kind of ethnic studies promotes the notion of white people oppressing and uh, places a bad feeling about white people uh, and therefore they need to be eliminated so here's my question if you eliminate all ethnic and cultural studies then whose culture are we studying and if that's not, I don't know, white supremacy, I don't know what is. But you see, again, you're trying to negate people's sense of who they are. And what we do know is that with the absence of that sense of self, all any number of maladies, if you will, will produce themselves. Hence, what we see as it relates to what I consider to be a, a huge growing problem of, of internalized uh, hatred and violence within groups. What impact are the things that we're all aware of? The growing unemployment, uh, investments in overseas endeavors on the part of the U.S. Sure. military, mm -hmm. and on and on and on. What do you think is going to be the outcome of this? Is it going to work itself out, <laughs> or is it going to continue to inflate? And I'm not even getting into the oil fields now. Oh, yeah, wow. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm drilling elsewhere. I don't think it's going to just work itself out. I think this is going to, this is a mess that is going to require a whole lot uh, to get fixed. But let me, let me kind of speak to what I think cumulatively what that kind of produces. Um, in my book, I talk about the whole idea. People are very concerned about violence. And it's, and it's very interesting how we look at violence. Now, of course, my research looked at the relationship of disrespect and adolescent violence, African-American males. I, I, there was a relationship between perceived disrespect by African-American males and the use of violence. This was proven empirically. Now, I wanted to look more specifically, though, even though I didn't get a chance to in my, in my research, I wanted to look closely at the relationship of anger to violence. Right, because usually one follows the other. So when I looked at anger, and we look at anger and break it down, anger is a result of block goals. 
If I have candy here and there's a, a child, an infant, uh, that's trying to reach candy, and every time they reach, I move the candy, and every time I put something in front of the candy, eventually there's a level of frustration that is a, it results in an explosion, right? Violence, anger. And what happens when you have cumulative block goals? Now, when you start looking at outsourcing, you're looking at the elimination of, of low-skilled jobs. Now you're looking at people trying to figure out, and large numbers of people, poor people, across the board, but largely people of color, competing for j jobs that are simply gone. Right. They're not there anymore. But still we have to survive. How, how do we survive when there, we are competing? We then, by virtue of going after the same thing, become enemies. Now let me put this in a very different perspective than someone white. You and I grew up with our parents saying, go to school, get a good education so you can get out of the suffering we've experienced. This is, this is what our parents taught us. So we go to school, we get A, B, and C. We get that education, we get it, we're so happy. We show up and they go, oh, you do have education, but you don't have E. You have A, B, C, and D, but you don't have E. And E is experience. So since you don't have experience, then you can't get the job. Okay, but now you see white children that they're actually trying to get the job. That's not what their parents are raising them to do. They're raising them to take over the business or to own or run it. It's a very different kind of thing. Our parents were saying, get the good job, get the education, get the good job, get out of the suffering, get out of the oppression. When, again, white children are being taught, yeah, get the education so you can run it. So they're not looking to compete for these jobs. And now that the jobs are gone, what are we going to do? You begin to run into the block goals over and over and over again. And then you begin to go, well, why am I experiencing these block goals? So let me give you a perspective. You have the upper class, you've got the middle class, you've got the, quote, lower class. None of which I really like the concept of those. But let's just look at them as they exist in America, in the shrinking middle class. So you have the upper class that basically controls the middle and lower class and they begin to fight each other because they say you're the reason and you got the middle class say, well I'm better than you and I hate the welfare queens and I hate those people however I'm not upset at the fortune 400 or Enron or all the rest of the folks I begin to focus my attention and that's how the masses get controlled and we then become the enemies of each other and that's what's happening on the ground and that to me is a possible explosion. And this to me means <laughs> we've got to take another break. This is amazing we'll how fast that goes. You have risen to national attention with your thesis, your powerful thesis on post traumatic slave syndrome. How has the passage of time impacted that thesis? Has it been digested? Has it even been ingested? <laughs> Do you see the fruits of it? Oh, absolutely. Um, matter, as a matter of fact, the, the response to it was, was far greater than I had, had anticipated. Um, and what it's resulting in, a lot of, there are a lot of folks all over, literally all over the world. I've actually gotten people from Australia, from China, various people who have read and studied the work, uh, people who are advancing the research, doing, doing other studies. Uh, there's a study that was done um, by a, a young woman. Uh, her name is Dr. Barbara Milton. And Dr. Barbara Milton did work looking at, and we, we kind of corresponded, and I did some mentoring with her, around the resiliency. Because she looked at slave, enslaved Africans and slave narratives. And she wanted to find what did, how did they cope? How did they how do they survive during those times and what are the coping mechanisms what are the s signs of resiliency that are existing right now and she compared those and looked at them and it was an incredible study that I also use uh, in my classroom to show that they're very similar there's only one thing that's different that in terms of uh, the notion of spirituality, of ritual, of culture, of family, of community connectedness as engagement and involvement with children, with adults, uh, all of these different varying um, uh, measurable pieces that re re result in resiliency, there was one that we have now that did not exist during that time based on her research reading slave narratives, and that was 
the necessity for an absence of violence within the group itself. That was, wasn't one of the cases because it wasn't apparently an issue. They weren't worried about them doing things to each other. We are concerned at this, at this stage, this resiliency is dependent upon an absence of that violence internally. And that is an important element that we have to take a look at.